yet he composed six novels and over 300 short stories. One of the best of these, one of the least well-known, is titled, Was It a Dream? There's only a little more than 2,000 words in length and is a testament to the clarity and economy of the Mopsalon style. Why does one love? How queer it is to see only one being in the world, to have only one thought in one's mind, only one desire in the heart and only one name on the lips, a name which comes up continually rising like the water in a spring from the depth of the soul to the lips, a name which one repeats over and over again, which one whispers ceaselessly everywhere like a prayer. I loved her madly. Our mystery drama, The Graveyard, is based on the classic short story of Guy de Maupassant and was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric. Stars Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Guy de Maupassant lived from 1850 to 1893, and the last of these years was spent struggling with and then succumbing to madness. This may account for the slight touch of morbidity that runs through his work. Yet the story we dramatize for you now deals with one of the most universal of human experiences, the indescribable, almost mystical experience of falling in love. Our drama begins inside one of the great churches of Paris. I was the last in the long line of penitents. I had positioned myself thus perfectly. For I had a long tale to tell the father before I could seek absolution. A long confession of love and loss and death, of unquenchable passion, of mad obsession, of grief unimaginable. At long last, the way was clear, and I found myself in the confessional box. Bless me, Father. Yes, my son. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned since my last confession. Go on, my son. I don't know how. You... You don't know me, Father. For that, you don't recognize my voice. There is something familiar. It's been a long time. More than a year. Before that, you were my confessor. More than that, my friend or so I once thought. Continue. I was a faithful communicant, Father, for many years. Until... Until... Tell me what troubles you, my son. Oh, it's such a long story. I have time. And so has God. But it all started. Everything began. Where I met her. I went to a ball, an elaborate ball given by friends. I've been of half a mind not to attend at all. For months, life had seemed so dreary, so monotonous. And then, that night, while I was standing with my friend Henri, viewing the guests with utter indifference when she... my life forever. Oh, oh, yeah. What is it? Have you suddenly come to life? Come to life? <laughs> yes, I have come to life. Who is that? Dear man, there are at least 200 people dancing. Oh, she is not dancing. She just came through the door. A very dressed in She's with an older woman wearing blue, blue and black stripes. Uh, they're just sitting down. Oh, yes. That's Madame Silvon. But who is the young girl in silver? Honey, Simon. Why? You ask me why? Why do you care? She is my fate. Oh, 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 oh. Come now, my dear friend. Do you know her? Do you know her aunt? Uh, not well. Well enough to introduce me. Well, then do it. Do it at once. pleasure of the waltz, and as though I were living in a dream, led the young Simon to the dance floor and took her in my arms. We circled the ballroom again, and again, and again. 
again. She floated like a cloud in my arms. Her pale blonde head just below my chin. A tiny hand in its white kid glove resting in mine. A fragile body moving in perfect rhythm to my own. I did not speak. I could not. I was like a man enchanted beneath a spell. I was conscious only for wishing the music would never stop. But of course, in time, it did. It stopped. Believe me, sir. What? Oh, forgive me. What did you say? Release me. The waltz has ended. The dancing is over. Oh, your pardon. You may take me back to my aunt. No. No? Why not? I want... I want to take you in my arms again. I think the music has stopped for certain lengths of time. Refreshments are being served on the veranda. Would you, would you care for something? A glass of champagne, perhaps. Would you care for that? Would you? There's only one thing I care for, Miss Sarah. Everything else is of no importance whatsoever. And what is that? Yourself, Anselm. Your love. I was not so impetuous as a rule, Father. I had a certain position in Parisian society. I had met and I had fancied a number of girls. But this, this was altogether different, a totally new experience. It lifted me to such heights that my whole life before this fateful meeting seemed insignificant, without meaning. Compose yourself, my son. Yes, yes, Father, yes, I'll try. I, I saw her the next day. She invited me for tea, and I took flowers, roses and lilies, all that I could hold. I think that her aunt eyed me with some suspicion, but I thought only of the niece whom I adored, to whom I had dedicated my every thought, my every wish, my life. Myself. Go on, my son. But the days. The days that followed. How can I describe them? And yet how well I remember them. Walks in the Luxembourg Gardens. Picnics in the Bois. Luncheons and dinners. I moved through all this with the certainty of a sleepwalker. My mind, my soul fixed on that not-too-distant day when I would put my heart at her feet and implore her to pick it up and hold it close to her own. As I knew she would. Yes, my son, go on. At last, the day arrived. I had suggested the previous evening that she'd come to my house for tea, and she had acquiesced. My good housekeeper, Therese, had cleaned from attic to cellar with even more than her usual thoroughness. Now, you'll serve everything out here, Therese. Yes, monsieur. Aha, uh -huh. now she'll... She'll, uh, sit there, don't you think? On the chaise long. Perfect. Yes. Uh, you have tea, of course. And coffee. What she really likes best is chocolate. I have chocolate. Mm. Now, now, what a noyer patisserie. Almond croissant, madeleine, zikar macaroon. Oh, perfect, perfect. I hope mademoiselle will be pleased. Oh, Therese, wait till you see her. Wait till you see my Simone. I am sure she is very pretty, monsieur. Pretty? Attractive. There is no one word to describe her, Therese. Could you describe an angel? I have never seen an angel. Well, you'll see one today. An angel with the insouciance of a wood nymph, the grace of a dryad. <laughs> am I talking wildly, Therese? You are in love, monsieur. Yes. Yes, I am in love. <laughs> I was in a fever awaiting her arrival. I, I thought I was going to be sick. I could not sit. I could not stand still. I moved from chair to chair, from room to room. And then, at last, at last she was there in my house. Oh, but it's beautiful. Beautiful. Do you think so? Do you really think so? You live here alone? Oh, yes. Alone. Of course, there's Therese and her husband. He tends the gardens. You have gardens. May I show you? Of course. The roses are in blue. Yellow, pink, red. Oh, lovely. Yes. Now, this is the veranda. Charming. Would you care to sit down? Here. Uh, here, here. This is a comfortable chaise. Thank you. Yes. 
Very comfortable. Uh, what would you like? Chocolate or tea? Uh, Therese will bring it. Or coffee. Uh, we have madeleine and, and, and macaroon. Not so fast. Not so fast. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Really, I'm, I'm very... It's all right. It's all right, my dear. What is it? I've never seen you like this. So... So erratic. It's just that I... I do you really like the house? But I told you. I know you told me, but... Are you sure that you really like it? Yes, 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 yes. But is there anything about it that you that, 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 you, that you don't like? Nothing. I think it's perfect. I, I want you to think that it's perfect. Is it so important, what I think? You don't know how important it is. Because, because, Simone, because I want you to share it with me. You want me to? To live here with me. You know how I love you. I think that you love me. Do you love me? Yes. As much as I love you? No, don't answer. I know that you can't love me the way I love you, but... But... But do you love me? Yes. Then will you come here to this house to live with me, to let me love you and protect you, adore you, to take care of you? Oh, my dear. Will you? Yes. Yes, my love. Oh, yes. The days and the weeks and the months that followed. How can I describe them? I loved her madly. Why does one love, Father? Why does one love? How queer it is to see only one being in the world. To have only one thought in one's mind. Only one desire in the heart. And only one name on the lips. A name which comes up continually from the depths of the soul to the lips. A name which one repeats over and over again. Which one whispers ceaselessly everywhere, like a prayer. I lived on her tenderness, on her caresses, in her arms, on her words. So completely wrapped up, bound and absorbed in everything which came from her. That I no longer cared whether it was day or night, or whether I was dead or alive on this old earth of ours. In all our time together, she asked for only one thing, one material thing. And I was happy, deliriously happy to buy it for her. I would have bought her the world. Sweetheart, could we have a mirror here? Here? Here in the hall? A big one. I need it. Well, then you shall have it. I needed to look at myself from head to foot before I go out. To see if my toilette looks well and is correct. Pretty. You are always correct. Always pretty. <laughs> I needed to reassure myself. We'll go together tomorrow and buy one. You shall pick it out. And so we did. We found the beautiful mirror, seven feet tall, supported by a pillar on either side, and mounted on a pedestal. The whole thing carved with cupids and garlands of flowers, and gilded all over. You must have seen that mirror, Father. You've been in my house. Have I? At least once. I have been in many houses, seen many mirrors. But you must remember this one. I can't be sure. You must remember me. You've heard my voice. You've heard it before. I don't know. Loud, raucous, raised in anger. It's hard to tell. Hurling awful words at you, Father, calling you names, blaspheming. You couldn't forget. I have not forgotten. Dear, merciful Lord, I have not forgotten. How could you forget? Have you ever wondered what transpires within the confessionals? I have. There must be times when sorrow and guilt, all intermingled, pour out from the confessor on the neutral ears of the priest. And from far above and beyond, the Lord takes note of the tears, the suffering, the regret, and the muffled excuses. Takes note and understands. I shall be back with Act Two in just a few moments. Against one wall of the nave of a great Gothic church in Paris stands an enclosed cubicle made of mahogany and richly carved. Within the cubicle are two men, one a priest, on a common citizen of Paris. 
Only a thin wall separates the two men. A thin wall and a foot-squared grill through which they converse. The citizen has been telling a long story to his confessor. A story of passion and wild romance. You have been in my house, Father. Have I? At least once. You must remember me. You've heard my voice before. I think perhaps. But go on, my son. Finish your story. As you will, Father. Simon and I lived in our house like two birds forever joined. I asked nothing more of life than to watch her every movement, hang upon her every word. To comb her pale blonde hair was an exquisite pleasure. To gaze on her pearl-colored body in the bath struck me mute with wonder. When she left the house, I left immediately after, because I could not endure its charms unless she was there to enhance them. But I waited until the very last minute... I so enjoyed those moments when she stood before the great mirror in the foyer, looking with pouting and pretended anxiety into the great glass. I would stand in back of her, charmed to watch both my darling and her reflection. Do you like this dress? Tell me. Oh, very much. You don't think purple is the wrong color? I think purple is exactly the right color. I was torn. The seamstress wanted to make it up in citron yellow. You look ravishing no matter what you wear. Pink, purple, yellow, green. Oh, you are perfection from top to toe. Don't muss my hair, darling. Look out, my bonnet. Let me go. Now first tell me where you're going in your purple and pink. Oh, there's an art show. Ancre and, and, and David and all those. I'll, I'll look in on that. Hortense will probably meet me there. And we'll lunch at uh, Prunier's and then shop. All right? If you must go. My love, I have to go out now and then. You'll be all right, won't you? Well, I shall manage to live, exist somehow, till seven o'clock. I was a man blessed beyond human deserving. I scarcely noticed the passing of the days. One day, I followed her into the foyer and stood silent but amused while she primped and preened herself before the huge mirror. She had never seemed so desirable. Well? Well? Well what? Do I look all right? You look like a little cherub. A cherub? Really? I'm not sure I want to look like a cherub. Can't be helped. That's the way you look. Well, I suppose it's all right. My darling, I think I heard thunder. Oh, no. You couldn't have. I don't want you to go out in the rain. But it's not raining. See... Look out the window. The sun is shining. But a storm might be coming up. You could get caught in it. Sweetheart, I have a fitting. Two fittings. I need the dresses. I need the shoes. I can't postpone either one. You hear? You hear that thunder? I can't help it. I have to go. I, I promised Hortense faithfully I'd meet her. Kiss me, darling. I have to be on my way. I wish you wouldn't go out. I'll be all right, so don't worry. <laughs> You'll get wrinkles. Goodbye, my love. I let her go. I could not hold her. I beat off the feeling of dread that engulfed me all afternoon. I paced the rooms of the house, listening to the thunder grow louder, watching the black clouds grow heavier. Then the storm burst. Late in the day, I came to rest in the void staring stupidly at the great mirror that had a few hours earlier held her reflection, all blue and white like a summer sky. I wrenched my eyes from the mirror and opened the front door. A handsome cab just pulled up in front of the house. Simone! Simone! Yes, darling? Come inside! Come inside! I'll pay the driver. Come inside quickly! I insisted she go straight to bed. She protested that there was no need, that she had not been out in the rain for so very long, that she did not get so very wet. You make such a fuss, darling. It's not necessary. It is necessary. I insist. Now, when you've finished your hot bath, you'll drink some chamomile tea, perhaps a small amount of brandy. Really, my love, such a fuss over nothing. Simone, if anything should happen to you... Nothing will happen. It'll be the end of me. I couldn't go on living. Come in. The tea you requested, monsieur? Oh, thank you, Therese. Give it to me. I brought a biscuit. Oh, good, good. Thank you. Thank you, Therese. Not at all, mademoiselle. 
Your hot tub is waiting. You can drink this in the bath. I shall break the biscuit into little pieces and and feed it to you like a mother bird. Oh, you are a dear. Oh, you're coughing. That stopped. Come along, my dear, thoughtful mother bird. The next day she coughed too. She coughed for about a week. Then she took to her bed. What happened then, Father, I, I do not altogether remember. But doctors came, wrote, and went away. Medicines were brought, and some women made her drink them. Her hands were hot. Her forehead was burning. Her eyes were bright and sad. When I spoke to her, she answered me, but I do not remember what we said. I have forgotten everything. Everything. She died. And I very well remember that last, slight, feeble sigh. It is over, monsieur. What happened then? I hardly know. But I do know that a priest came to my house. A priest who meant well, but... I am here to offer you what comfort I can, monsieur. There is no comfort. She was everything to me. I lived by the light of her eyes. I rose in the morning, slept at night with no thought but of her. She was my life, my heart. Uh, she was your mistress? Uh, did you hear me, monsieur? Why do you stare at me? My mistress? You dare to call her my mistress? I only wanted you to You insult her. You want to degrade her in my eyes. My son. You dare to call her my mistress. She was my soul. I did not mean to... You! What could you possibly know of a love like mine? Please, I only... You make me sick. You know nothing. You know nothing of life. So what can you possibly know of death? Please, listen you to me. You feel nothing. Nothing. In your black robes, you descend like a vulture on this house, which was her home. The house she sanctified with her presence. Made holy. Yes, made holy because she condescended to live within its walls. My son, my son. You dare to put a name to my darling, my best beloved, my only love. I wanted only to... You dare to soil her name, you. You cheat, you sanctimonious cheat. Leave my house. I cannot endure your presence. Leave me to my memories and my grief. Go and leave me alone. If you should need me, I shall not need you. If you need God, I shall not need God. He has taken from me all that I ever needed or wanted, so why should I need or want him? Oh, my son. If you have any pity, go away and leave me alone. Now, you know who I am, Father. Yes. I treated you so badly. I'm heartily sorry, Father. I did not understand, perhaps, what this girl meant to you. I should have had more feeling. Well, I should have had more patience. But what I did to you that day, Father, that was not my only sin. It was only the beginning of many, many sins. Do you want to tell me? If you will listen to my miserable story. Of course I will listen. <sighs> They consulted me about the funeral, but I do not remember anything that they said. Although I recollect the coffin and the sound of the hammer when they nailed her down. In it. Oh, God. Oh, God, I can't. Try to compose yourself, my son. Try to tell me the rest of this sad story, if you can. She was buried. Buried. She, in that hole... Some people came, female friends. I made my escape and ran away. I ran and then walked through the streets. I went home. And the next morning, I left Paris and started on a journey. Is that all? All? Is that all? No, no, that is not all. No. What sins, what further sins followed in the wake of my departure, you would scarcely believe. But can you believe that wherever I went... Her face followed me. There were times lying on some strange bed in some strange city. I would smell her perfume. 
It would creep into the air like some celestial vapor. And I would be absorbed into it until I myself vanished and the scent took over. Do you understand? The mystics have smelled the perfume of roses when there were no roses. Go on. Sometimes it was her voice falling upon my ear, shutting out the street sounds, silencing the noise of cities or the singing of the birds in the country or the conversation of others. I heard only her sweet voice, her voice, her voice, her voice. No other voice but hers, no other face but hers, no other sense but hers, no one anywhere but her. Do you understand, Father? I understand that you suffered, yes, a great deal. Yes. Yes, I suffered. But it is what I did to ease my suffering. Not that it was ever eased, but what I did to try to shut out the sight of her, silence the sound of her, stifle the smell of her. The atrocities I committed, the obscenities I practiced, the cruelties, all these I must confess to you if I am ever to know peace again. To what lengths will men not go to ease the agony of a tortured mind? What twisting and turning will he not subject his body to? Or his mind? Or both? There are drugs, he may try them. There is debauchery, he may resort to that. He may even become a criminal and drive himself to prison. Whatever he does, whatever path he follows... He is seeking one thing only. Rest for his troubled mind. Peace for his suffering soul. I shall continue with Act Three in just a few moments. A man has sought out a particular priest to make confession. A particular man who is blurting out the story of his love for a young girl, a love to which he dedicated everything he had, his worldly goods, his thoughts, his life, himself. He lived by the light of her eyes. Then one day she died. After the funeral, he went home, packed the suitcase, and fled from Paris. It is what I did to ease my suffering, Father. Not that it was ever eased. What I did to shut out the sight of her, silence the sound of her, stifle the smell of her, the atrocities I committed, the obscenities I practiced, the cruelties I inflicted. Oh, my sweet savior. You want to tell me now? I must. It can't wait. Then I'm listening. I grew afraid to travel alone. I was afraid of what I might do next. So I wrote to my friend Henri, the same friend who had presented me to Simone, urging him to meet me in Casablanca. Good friend that he is, he agreed. We arranged to meet at a sidewalk cafe. There you are. Ari. It is you, isn't it? Of course it is. Sit down. But you look terrible. (laughs) Nonsense. What do you want to drink? It's not nonsense. What have you been doing to yourself? I'm trying to forget her. Oh, but this is no way to forget her, my friend. What is the way? I don't know, but... That's just it. Nobody knows. I don't know either. What would you have to drink? You're drinking absinthe, aren't you? Uh, Is that what you want? Oh, heavens no. Pierre, you were never like this. Well, I am now. What have you been doing? Oh, this and that. What do you want to drink? Nothing, nothing. I want another absinthe. Waiter, where's the waiter? My friend, please, don't do this. With Henri, I covered the bazaars, the clubs, and the brothels of Casablanca. The days there are blurred in my memory. It's as though a man other than myself did the things I did. And even those things are vague, undefined. As though they happened in another time, another place, to another person. At any rate, there came a day when Henri burst into my hotel room. His face was white and pinched, but his eyes blazed. Wake up. Wake up. What 
What? what, what Pack your bags. We're leaving. Oh, what's the matter? All right, I'll do it for you. What for? What is the matter? You're honey? in trouble, my friend. Bad trouble. Where's your suitcase? Oh, what trouble? Don't you know? I don't know. Trouble, you say? You remember that girl last night? Uh, what girl? Which girl? Oh, good Lord, you don't even remember. The girl, the one you picked up at the nightclub. Oh, yeah. Oh, you do remember that, don't you? Well, I think you I... You took am. her back to her room. Do you remember? No, you don't remember. I could see you don't. Well, you did. I don't suppose you remember what you did after that, do you? Henri, please. The absence has rotted your brain, my friend. You don't know what to you do, and once you've done it, you don't remember it. Please. All right, look at me. Look at me. Henri, let go. I said, look at me. What? What did I do? You have killed that girl. Perhaps you did kill her. I don't know. She's in the hospital now. Perhaps she'll recover. Perhaps she won't. I... I did that? Why? Oh, heaven knows. Why would I do a thing like that? At the moment, it doesn't matter why. What matters is that I'm going to take you home. Oh, <laughs> I have no home. Back to Paris. You have a house there. It's a house, not home. Well, at least you'll have Therese to look after you, feed you properly, and you'll have your own doctor, your priest. I can't tell them. You have to tell them. <laughs> And when I saw my room again, our room, our bed, our furniture, everything that remains of the life of a human being after death, I was seized by such a violent attack of fresh grief that I felt like opening the window and throwing myself out into the street. I could not remain any longer among these things, between these walls which had enclosed and sheltered her, which retained a thousand atoms of her of her skin and of her breath in their imperceptible crevices. I took up my hat to make my escape, and just as I reached the door, I passed the large glass in the foyer which she had put there so that she might look at herself every day from head to foot. I stopped short in front of that looking glass in which she had been so often reflected, so often that it must have retained her reflection. I was standing there, trembling, with my eyes fixed on the glass, on that flat, profound, empty glass which had contained her entirely and had possessed her as much as I. I felt as if I loved that glass. I touched it. It was cold. I stretched my arms around it tried to hold it close to me, to warm it with my body, to make it live again. It was tall. It was heavy. I strained to hold it close. Close. And then... Oh! Oh! What was that? Oh! No! Oh, the mirror. What, What happened? Monsieur, are you all right? Here, let, let me help you. You're bleeding. No, no. I'm all right. Oh, let me help you. You're trying to move the mirror. Why didn't you call me? I'd have helped you. Oh, your poor face all cut and bleeding. I'll fetch a doctor. No, no. I don't need one. I don't well, want... Monsieur, you... There's only one thing I need or want. If I can't have that, I want nothing. Monsieur, where are you going? I went out without knowing without wishing it, and toward the cemetery. I found her simple grave, a white marble cross with these few words. She loved, was loved, and died. She is there below, I thought, decayed. I sobbed with my forehead on the ground, and I stayed there for a long time, a long time. And then I saw that it was getting dark. And a strange, mad wish, the wish of a despairing lover, seized me. I wished to pass the night weeping on her grave. But then I thought I would be seen and driven out. How was I to manage? Oh, I was cunning, and I got up and began to roam about in that city of the dead. I walked and walked. How small... This city is compared with the other. 
the city in which we live. And yet how much more numerous the dead are than the living. Are you all right, my son? Yes, yes, I'm all right. I must finish. I must finish my story. I was alone. Perfectly alone. When it was quite dark, I began to walk softly, slowly, inaudibly, through that ground full of dead people. I wandered about for a long time, but I could not find her grave again. I went on with extended arms, knocking against the tombs with my hands, my feet, my knees, my chest, even with my head, without being able to find her. I groped like a blind man. I felt the stones, the crosses, the iron railings. I read the names with my fingers by passing them over the letters. Oh, I was frightened. Horribly frightened. Graves. Graves. Nothing but graves. On my right, on my left, in front of me, around me, everywhere, there were graves. I sat down on one of them. I could not walk any longer. My knees were so weak. I could hear my heart beat. Yes. And I heard something else as well. What? What? A confused, nameless noise. Was the noise in my head? In the impenetrable night? Or beneath the mysterious earth? The earth sown with human corpses? I was paralyzed with terror, cold with fright, ready to shout out, ready to die. Yes, to die, on the moment to die. Oh, my Let me finish, Father. Suddenly, it seemed to me, it seemed to me that the slab of marble on which I sat was moving, yes, moving, as if it were being raised. With a bound, I sprang onto the neighboring tomb, and I saw, yes, I distinctly saw the stone which I had just quitted rise upright. And then the dead person appeared. A naked skeleton pushing the stone back. I saw it quite clearly, though the night was so dark. On the headstone, I had read, Here lies Jacques Oliphant, who died at the age of 51. He loved his family, was kind and honorable, and died in the grace of the Lord. The dead man, or his ghost, picked up a stone off the path. A little pointed stone. And he began to scrape the letters carefully. He slowly effaced them. And with the hollows of his eyes, he looked at the place where they had been engraved. And then with the tip of the bone that had been his forefinger, he wrote in luminous letters. I strained to see the new words he was inscribing. Here lies Jacques Olivon, who died at the age of 51. He hastened his father's death by his unkindness as he wished to inherit his fortune. He tortured his wife, tormented his children, deceived his neighbors, robbed everyone he could, and died wretched. The dead man stood motionless, looking at his work. On turning around, I saw that all the graves were open, that all the dead bodies had emerged from them, and that all had effaced the lines inscribed on the gravestones by their relations, substituting the truth instead. The grave to my right, whose headstone had read, Marie Moussier, devoted wife and mother, faithful friend, charitable neighbor, dead at the age of 84. The skeleton of an old woman was bent over it, and carefully writing with her bony finger the new words, spoke solemnly in a strange, quavering voice. Marie Moussier, gossip, scandal monger, hated her husband throughout her married life. They grudged him their children and died mean of spirit at war with herself and the world at the age of 84. Behind me, another grave opened and a ghostly figure emerged. His stone read, Alphonse Perrault, merchant and philanthropist, lies here, mourned by all who loved him for his many beneficent works. Alphonse Perrault, merchant and unwilling philanthropist, lies here, mourned by none who knew his real reason. 
reason for everything he did. To create an image of himself as one who loved his fellow man. The better to steal from him behind his back. I saw that all had been the tormentors of their neighbors. Malicious, dishonest hypocrites, liars, rogues, that they had stolen, deceived, performed every disgraceful, every abominable action. These good fathers, these faithful wives, these devoted sons, these chaste daughters, these honest tradesmen, these men and women who were called irreproachable. They were all writing on the threshold of their eternal abode. The truth, the terrible and the holy truth of which everybody was ignorant or pretended to be ignorant while they were alive. My son, my son. I'm almost finished, Father. I thought that she, she too, must have written something on her tombstone. Now, running without fear among the half-open coffins, among the corpses and the skeletons, I went toward her, sure that I should find her immediately. I recognized her at once without seeing her face, which was covered by the winding sheet. On the marble cross, where shortly before I had read, she loved, was loved, and died, were new words, words she now spoke aloud. Having gone out in the rain one day in order to deceive her lover, she caught cold and died. It appears that they found me at daybreak, lying on the grave, unconscious. My son, my son, but you must realize, poor man, that this was all a delusion. The delusion of a fevered brain, a waking dream. Oh, no. No, it was all quite true. That she betrayed you? And not for the first time, Father. I have always known it. I have known it. All along. truths which are impossible to face. There are realities which can destroy us if we try to come to grips with them before we are ready. Once grasped, they become simpler, more treatable, even after a while commonplace. How long it takes to accept the unacceptable, that depends on the sufferer and the intensity of the suffering he bears. I shall return shortly. trust that Monsieur de Maupassant, from wherever he dwells beyond the grave, will not think we have done violence to his brief and fragile tale. In trying to transpose it into dramatic form, we have used some of his own words, as many as possible, and more of our own. If we have been unkind to his original work, we ask his pardon and offer as an excuse our sincere desire to prevent...